Jesus Christ is a controversial figure because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Imagine a letter sent to Caesar of Rome. The Roman persecutions of Christianity during the first and second centuries must have been isolated erratic events. Vividly detailing the appearance, demeanor, and divine presence of Jesus Christ. The historical Jesus, uh, as in someone for whom there's empirical evidence that he actually existed. This old writing, called the Letter of Lentulus, provides a unique first-hand story of Jesus. They live under less than desirable conditions, and they die that way. There's nothing historically remarkable about that. The mystery surrounding Jesus' actual appearance has enchanted people for years. Could the solution lie in this letter? Join us as we uncover the eyewitness of Jesus, how the Letter of Lentulus reveals Jesus in great detail to Caesar of Rome, Jesus Christ in art. Art has been a profound means of expressing human thoughts, emotions, and beliefs for millennia. One of the most recognized individuals in Western art is Jesus Christ. From the early Christian era to the present, Jesus has been depicted in hundreds of paintings, sculptures, and other works of art. This piece was um, wrapped up underneath the stairs for many years. It was amazing to me to be able to see this into the light again after so many years. In addition to serving as artistic works, these depictions serve as religious symbols and often convey the personal, cultural, and theological beliefs of artists over time. Francois Solon's rendition of Jesus is a prominent painting in this setting. It is based on Western art traditions but when viewed in the context of other artistic and theological representations, it takes on a wider significance. Throughout history, artists have sought to depict Jesus Christ in ways that reflect both their religious convictions and the cultural context in which they worked. For example, Jesus was often shown in early Christian art as a young bearded man who was the good shepherd guiding his flock. Jesus' death on the cross was hugely difficult for the early Christians. It was extremely embarrassing. In Byzantine art, Jesus was depicted as possessing greater celestial and regal qualities. He was usually portrayed with a severe, authoritative face and a halo surrounding him, signifying his divinity. Jesus was visualized differently in Western art across time, particularly during the Renaissance. Artists such as Michelangelo, Raphael, and Leonardo da Vinci depicted Jesus in ways that demonstrated their technical mastery as well as their own interpretations of his essence. Throughout these pieces, Jesus is frequently portrayed as an idealized human being who embodies both divinity and humanity. He has perfect proportions and serene expressions. These depictions are often deeply influenced by the European aesthetic norms of the time, where Jesus is frequently shown with pale skin light brown or blonde hair, and blue or light-colored eyes. These Western interpretations of Jesus, however, are not consistent with his most likely historical look. Since Jesus was a Jew born in the Middle East, historians generally agree that he would have possessed more regional features, including darker skin, brown eyes, and dark hair. This historical truth has sparked a lot of discussion about how Jesus has been portrayed in art. Just talking about this portrait of Jesus before the break, it's called Prince of Peace and featured in the book Heaven is for Real. Particularly in contemporary times, Francois Solon's image of Jesus, however rooted in traditional Western art, reflects these debates since it combines elements of idealized European imagery with more realistic, humanized representations of Christ. This is the perfect time to paint the story of love, unity, and peace. A carpenter. Many people are aware of Francois Solon's sad and dramatic depictions of religious leaders. His portrayal of Jesus offers a nuanced perspective of Christ's humanity despite its European roots. Compared to the idealized and frequently even superhuman portrayals of Jesus that are usual in Renaissance art, Solon's painting of the same subject is more approachable and human. The basic idea of Christian theology that Christ is both divine and human is illustrated in this picture. One of Jesus' most striking features in Solon's painting is his gorgeous brown eyes. The eyes, sometimes called the windows to the soul, are the focal point of this composition. They discuss the compassion and sorrow that are inherent to the Christ story. Jesus is firmly established in the universal feelings of love, loss, and salvation by the deep brown color of his eyes in this artwork, which symbolizes his humanity. Also, Jesus is shown by Solon as having darker skin. 
which contrasts strongly with the traditional European view of Christ's light skin. In spite of accurately reflecting historical reality, Solon's depiction of a brown-skinned Jesus challenges viewers' beliefs about Christ's appearance. What makes Solon's depiction of Jesus so compelling is the fact that his dark face and eyes compel us to consider Christ's humanity in greater detail. By deviating from the European idealization of Jesus, everybody is irreplaceable and unique, and I want people to to get inspired by looking at this painting. Solon's picture demonstrates how Christ's message of compassion, pardon, and redemption crosses ethnic or cultural boundaries. In spite reminding us that Christ came for everyone, regardless of origin or appearance, he provides a more historically accurate image of Jesus. Not only are Jesus's brown complexion and eyes literally accurate, but they also carry an important symbolic significance. Brown eyes are linked to warmth, approachability, and depth of feeling in many cultures. In trying to reconstruct the life of Jesus is simply that we don't have sources that come from the actual time. Christ is portrayed with brown eyes by Solon and other artists who have used similar motifs to emphasize Christ's humanity and his ability to understand the suffering and challenges of everyday people. Significant symbolic weight is also attached to brown skin. Darker complexion is connected to the soil, humility, and common folk in numerous civilizations. The idea that Christ is not an aloof, distant figure but rather one who is closely related to the lives of those who struggle, those who are marginalized, and those who are sometimes disregarded by society is emphasized by artists such as Solon, who show Jesus as having brown complexion. The image of Jesus withstand the traditional, long-standing Eurocentric representation of Christ in Western art by having brown eyes and skin. Artists such as Solon foster a perception of Jesus as a culturally and ethnically neutral rescuer by providing an alternative image of the Christ figure. How do changes in Jesus' eyes and skin make us rethink centuries of traditional images and see his humanity in a new way? Let's explore. Isaiah, the prophet of the Old Testament on the coming Savior, scripture always influences how Jesus is portrayed in art especially when it comes to passages that discuss his character and mission. The matter of faith. There have been men, many of them, who claim to be a new Messiah. Isaiah, an Old Testament prophet, provides multiple prophecies regarding the arrival of the Messiah, making it one of the most important texts among them. In Isaiah 53, the prophet speaks of a suffering servant who will bear the sins of the people and use his suffering to effect redemption. Jesus is very much like most people, statistically speaking, who have ever existed in the world, to record the deeds of a person like Jesus. The description of the Messiah found in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 2 and 3, is notably moving. He lacked any grandeur or beauty to draw us in, and there was nothing in his look that made us want him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. You've got dozens and in fact hundreds of manuscripts from the first uh, three or four or five centuries. This description of the Messiah stands in stark contrast to the idealized depictions of Jesus that have been common in Western art. According to Isaiah, the coming savior would not be a figure of physical beauty or grandeur. Rather, he would be a humble, suffering servant rejected by the very people he came to save. This portrayal of the Messiah resonates deeply with Solon's depiction of Jesus, which emphasizes his humanity and his connection to the suffering of the world. Isaiah's prophecy also speaks to the role of the Messiah as a major figure who bears the sins of others. In Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5, the prophet writes, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. This particular uh, Jesus Christ uh, is the Son of God who went on to, to die and rise again. This image of the suffering servant is central to Christian theology and is often reflected in artistic depictions of Jesus, particularly in works that focus on his crucifixion. Even though Solon's painting does not depict the hanging directly, the sadness and compassion that are evident in Christ's brown eyes help to convey this aspect of his mission. Apart from the predictions of Isaiah, 
the Book of Psalms has other passages that are conventionally understood to allude to the impending arrival of the Messiah. Psalm 22 is one of the most well-known of them and is frequently seen as a prophetic precursor to the crucifixion of Jesus. The psalm opens with the terrible words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Words that Jesus himself would later utter on the cross, according to the Gospels. Thought about Jesus by the way they kept his memory alive, by the way that they told the story. Psalm 22 goes on to describe the suffering of the psalmist in terms that closely parallel the crucifixion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted within me. My mouth is dried like a potsherd, and my tongue staffs to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death as a city was built precisely at the time that Jesus was growing up and living just next door. Psalm 22, verses 14 and 15. This very description of suffering aligns with the portrayal of Jesus in many works of art, particularly those that focus on his passion. The image of Christ as the suffering servant, bearing the weight of the world's sins, is a central theme in Christian art and it is powerfully expressed in both Psalm 22 and Isaiah's prophecies. Moreover, Psalm 22 concludes with a note of hope, as the psalmist declares that despite his suffering, God has not abandoned him. You who fear the Lord praise him, for he has not disliked or scorned the suffering of the distressed one. Uh, and bring salvation to the world. So uh, this isn't mere history. Uh, it's not less than history, but it is history with a message. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. Psalm 22, verses 23 and 24. This message of hope and redemption is a key theme in Christian art, and it is often depict the resurrection, where Christ is shown as triumphant over death and suffering. The controversial description of Jesus Christ. The historical and visual depiction of Jesus Christ has been a topic of fascination for scholars, historians, and theologians for centuries. Jesus is arguably one of the most iconic figures in human history, and as such, the question of what he actually looked like has intrigued believers and skeptics alike. Over the years, various descriptions of Jesus have emerged, each offering unique insights, although the authenticity of many of these accounts remains debated. Among the most famous and widely discussed sources of such descriptions are the Letter of Lentulus, which allegedly provides a physical description of Jesus and Pontius Pilate's supposed eyewitness account. These documents, whether apocryphal or historical, have been the subject of significant scrutiny and debate. In addition, the Antiquities of the Jews by Josephus and letters attributed to the high priest Caiaphas and other similar figures also play key roles in the discourse around the appearance and nature of Jesus. This essay will explore in depth the key documents and historical accounts that claim to describe Jesus, analyze the controversies surrounding their authenticity, and assess their historical significance. Although widely circulated in the Middle Ages, the letter's origins are shrouded in mystery, and its authenticity has been a point of contention among scholars. It is often considered an apocryphal document, yet it continues to captivate interest because it provides one of the few detailed physical descriptions of Jesus. According to the letter of Lentulus, Jesus is described as having a noble and commanding presence with a body remarkable for its symmetry. His hair is said to be the color of a ripe chestnut, and it is worn in a long, flowing manner parted in the middle. His face is described as serene and dignified with no signs of vanity or arrogance. The letter mentions that Jesus' beard is of a similar color to his hair, short and neatly kept. His eyes are depicted as variegated, capable of conveying great depth and wisdom. Lentulus also describes Jesus as being neither short nor tall, but of medium height, with an air of nobility and gravitas that commands respect wherever he goes. This letter became widely popular in medieval times, especially because it offered a visual portrayal of Jesus, something that had been largely missing from early Christian tradition. In the centuries that followed, artists used this description as a template for portraying Jesus in religious art, contributing to the common depictions of Jesus with flowing hair, a symmetrical face, and an aura of gentleness and nobility. However, despite its influence, scholars remain divided on the letter's authenticity as there is no definitive proof of its existence before the 15th century. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor who presided over Jesus' trial and ultimately sentenced him to be crucified, 
is another key figure in the narrative of Jesus' life and death. Although Pilate is a historical figure mentioned in multiple sources, including the New Testament, there are also apocryphal letters and writings attributed to him. One of these supposed letters, addressed to Emperor Tiberius, is said to provide an eyewitness account of Jesus. In this letter, Pilate allegedly describes Jesus as a striking figure with an aura of divinity and authority. According to the text, Pilate was deeply moved by Jesus' calm demeanor during the trial, noting that Jesus did not show fear or anger despite the accusations against him. Pilate is said to have been impressed by Jesus' wisdom and eloquence, describing him as possessing a kind of supernatural serenity that set him apart from ordinary men. The letter goes on to describe Jesus' physical appearance in vague but reverent terms. Jesus is depicted as tall, with flowing hair and an unblemished face. The letter also implies that Pilate had serious reservations about sentencing Jesus to death, hinting that he believed Jesus to be an innocent man. However, Pilate ultimately caved to political pressure, allowing the Jewish authorities to have their way. Another figure frequently mentioned in relation to Jesus is Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest who played a key role in Jesus' arrest and trial. Caiaphas is described in the New Testament as the high priest who, along with the Sanhedrin, condemned Jesus for blasphemy and sought his execution. Caiaphas is believed to have written letters or decrees concerning Jesus, though these writings have been largely lost to history. One purported letter, addressed to the Roman authorities, describes Jesus as a dangerous figure who was gaining too much influence among the Jewish people. Caiaphas is said to have viewed Jesus as a threat to the established religious order, accusing him of false claims of divinity and miracles. While no physical description of Jesus is found in the writings attributed to Caiaphas, his role as an eyewitness is significant. His actions and decisions helped shape the course of events that led to Jesus' crucifixion. Caiaphas's hostility toward Jesus reflects the complex religious and political dynamics of the time where Roman occupation and Jewish religious authority were in a delicate balance. Jesus' growing popularity and his challenge to the status quo upset this balance, prompting Caiaphas and the Jewish authorities to take drastic action. What did Jesus really look like? Let's find out. The only surviving description of Jesus. Despite the various apocryphal letters and writings, there is only one physical description of Jesus that is widely believed to have survived from antiquity, a letter from a Roman official named Publius Lentulus to the Roman Senate. The original letter is dated to the reign of Emperor Tiberius, which lasted from Anno Domini 14 to Anno Domini 37. However, there is little historical verification of this letter's authenticity. Many scholars believe it to be a later forgery, as no contemporary sources mention Lentulus or his letter. The lack of corroborating evidence, combined with the stylistic and anachronistic elements of the letter, has led most historians to conclude that the description of Jesus provided in the letter is not a genuine historical account. One of the most important historical sources that mentions Jesus is Antiquities of the Jews, written by the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus. In this work, Josephus refers to Jesus as a wise teacher and miracle worker, noting that he gained a significant following among both Jews and Gentiles. Josephus describes Jesus as being condemned by Pilate and crucified, but he also notes that Jesus' followers claimed that he rose from the dead and continued to preach his teachings. However, Josephus does not provide a physical description of Jesus in Antiquities of the Jews. His account is primarily focused on Jesus' actions and the impact of his teachings. This has led to speculation that Josephus either did not consider Jesus' physical appearance to be important, or that he was deliberately avoiding any descriptions that might encourage idolatry or veneration of physical representations. One of the most detailed aspects of the letter of Lentulus is the description of Jesus' hair and facial features. This description is in line with traditional depictions of Jesus in Western art where he is often shown with long, flowing hair. Lentulus also describes Jesus' beard as being of the same color and neatly trimmed. The letter goes on to describe Jesus' nose as being well-proportioned and his mouth as graceful, with a voice that was soft and gentle. Cordiglia also suggested that Jesus possessed a kind of megalocephalic quality, meaning that his brain and intellect were unusually large for a man of his era. This interpretation is based on the descriptions of Jesus' wisdom and eloquence, as well as the fact that he was often depicted as a figure of great intelligence and insight. According to Cordiglia, 
Jesus' brain capacity was likely greater than that of the average man, which contributed to his extraordinary ability to teach and inspire. Jesus' appearance and the early church fathers. Figures such as Justin Martyr, Origen, St. Augustine, and Cyril of Jerusalem offered various interpretations rooted in Scripture, drawing from texts like the Book of Isaiah and Psalms to discuss not only Jesus' physical characteristics, but also the theological implications of his appearance. These early discussions played a critical role in shaping the ways in which Christians from different periods viewed Christ, not merely as a historical figure, and it is one of the real untold ironies of Jewish history, but as a theological entity that transcends simple human attributes. Additionally, the rise of Emperor Constantine in the fourth century brought political protection to Christianity, which contributed to the evolving artistic and theological depictions of Christ. In the second century, church fathers began to address the issue of Jesus' physical appearance, largely because of the growing interest among Christian believers and because of the challenge of presenting Christ to a Greco-Roman world steeped in the visual culture of statues and idols. Among the most prominent early Christian thinkers was Justin Martyr, an apologist who converted to Christianity from paganism. He lived in the Roman Empire during a period when Christians were still a minority, often persecuted for their beliefs. In Justin's time, Christians often had to defend their faith, including the idea that the Son of God had incarnated in human form. Justin Martyr did not offer a detailed physical description of Jesus, but he did refer to the prophecy in Isaiah 53 verse 2, which reads, He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. This interpretation had significant theological implications. It underscored the idea that Jesus was not a worldly king or a figure of earthly power. Our best guess for the birth date of Jesus would be 4 BCE. In other words, he was born. Rather, his greatness lay in his spiritual authority and divine mission. By focusing on Isaiah's description of the suffering servant, Justin and others emphasized that Jesus' role was to suffer and to save humanity, not to impress or intimidate through physical beauty. Origen, another influential early Christian theologian who lived in the third century, echoed Justin's views. Origen wrote extensively on the nature of Christ and his dual nature as both fully divine and fully human. For Origen, the suggestion that Jesus had an ordinary or even humble appearance further highlighted the mystery of the Incarnation, the idea that God took on human form in the person of Jesus. This event occurs in the last week of Jesus' life. This humbling of the divine to take on the limitations of a human body with all its flaws and imperfections was central to Origen's theological reflections. For Origen, the notion that Jesus was not physically remarkable reinforced the belief that his true power and beauty lay in his spiritual nature. By citing Isaiah, these early Christian thinkers were engaging in a form of theological apologetics. In a Roman world where physical beauty, strength, and power were highly valued, particularly in their gods and emperors, early Christians had to defend the idea that their savior could have been by worldly standards, physically unimpressive. In this way, they inverted the cultural expectations of beauty and power, showing that Jesus' true majesty lay in his humility, suffering, and spiritual authority. However, while Justin Martyr and Origen used Isaiah 53 to emphasize the humility of Christ's appearance, other early theologians pointed to Psalm 45 as a counterpoint. Psalm 45 verse 2 states, You are the most excellent of men, and your lips have been anointed with grace since God has blessed you forever. This passage, interpreted as a messianic prophecy, presents a picture of a glorious and exalted figure. In this view, Jesus is described as fairer than the sons of men, suggesting that he possessed a divine beauty and grace that set him apart. At this time, there was a wise man called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. The reference to Psalm 45 implies that while Jesus might not have conformed to traditional standards of physical beauty, he still possessed a form of beauty, one that was divine and transcended mere physicality. This view allowed early Christians to reconcile the seemingly contradictory images of Jesus as both the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 and the majestic king described in Psalm 45. The tension between these two views reflects the early Christian understanding of Jesus as both fully human and fully divine. 
He could be humble and ordinary in his human form, yet also magnificent and transcendent in his divine nature. The contrast between the two descriptions also reveals an important theological development. The idea that Jesus' beauty, like his nature, could not be easily categorized or defined by human standards. His beauty was not about physical attractiveness, but rather about his inner holiness, his grace, and his divine mission. This dual understanding of Jesus' appearance as both humble and glorious was to play a significant role in Christian art and theology for centuries to come. How could Jesus be both humble and glorious in appearance? Let's explore the surprising answer, St. Augustine's interpretation of Christ's appearance. In the fourth and fifth centuries, St. Augustine of Hippo, one of the most influential theologians in Christian history, weighed in on the question of Jesus' appearance. Augustine took a philosophical and allegorical approach to the issue. While he acknowledged the scriptural references to Jesus' humble appearance in Isaiah 53, he also emphasized that Christ's true beauty lay in his nature as the Word of God and his role as the Redeemer of humanity. Augustine proposed that Christ's appearance was paradoxical. On the one hand, he was unattractive by worldly standards. On the other hand, he was the embodiment of divine beauty. Augustine saw Jesus' physical appearance as secondary to his spiritual beauty. He tells us that they were pretty uh, abusive and, and corrupt administrators. In his famous work, City of God, Augustine argued that true beauty was not found in the material world, but in the soul and in the divine. Thus, even if Jesus appeared as an ordinary or even unattractive man, his inner beauty, his wisdom, his grace, and his sacrifice for humanity the good news I bring you is this. Your captivity is over. Made him far more beautiful than any physical form could express. Augustine's interpretation of Christ's appearance was deeply rooted in his broader theological views about the nature of beauty and the human soul. For Augustine, beauty was not something that could be measured by physical standards. It was a reflection of divine order, harmony, and goodness. In this sense, Jesus was the epitome of beauty, not because of his physical attributes, but because he was the Word made flesh, the ultimate expression of God's love and grace. Another important figure in early Christian thought was Cyril of Jerusalem, a fourth century bishop who played a key role in shaping the early church's teachings on Christ's nature. Of different social levels represented in these early Christian communities, not people at the absolutely top, Cyril's contributions to the discussion of Jesus' appearance were not so much about his physical features, but about his ability to become all things to all people. In other words, Cyril emphasized that Jesus, through his incarnation, adapted himself to the weaknesses and infirmities of humanity. Cyril suggested that Jesus' appearance was part of his mission to save humanity. By taking on a humble, ordinary form, Jesus was able to connect with people of all walks of life, including the poor, the sick, and the marginalized. Cyril argued that Jesus deliberately chose to appear in a form that was accessible to everyone, rather than adopting the majestic appearance of a king or a deity. In this way, Jesus' appearance was not a reflection of his divine glory, but a sign of his willingness to lower himself to the level of humanity in order to save it. This idea of Jesus becoming all things to all people had profound implications for early Christian theology. It suggested that Jesus' mission was universal, extending to all people, regardless of their social status, race, or nationality. Jesus' ability to adopt himself to human infirmities also reflected the early church's understanding of the Incarnation as an act of divine humility and love. Jesus' appearance, therefore, was not a matter of physical beauty or majesty, but of spiritual accessibility and compassion. The fourth century marked a significant turning point for Christianity, particularly in the way Jesus was depicted and understood. Much of this shift can be attributed to the role of Emperor Constantine, who played a crucial role in protecting and promoting Christianity within the Roman Empire. Before Constantine's reign, Christians were often persecuted, and their faith was not recognized as a legitimate religion. This made it difficult for Christian theology, including ideas about Jesus' appearance, to develop openly. However, in Anno Domini 313, Constantine issued the Edict of Milan, which granted religious tolerance to Christians and allowed them to practice their faith freely. This was a major victory for the early church, 
as it provided Christians with the political and social protection they needed to flourish. Constantine himself converted to Christianity, further cementing its status within the Roman Empire. Under Constantine's rule, Christianity began to evolve from a persecuted minority religion into the dominant faith of the empire. This shift had profound effects on the ways in which Jesus was portrayed. Artists and theologians, now working in an environment of imperial support, were able to explore new ways of depicting Jesus, both as a humble servant and as a divine king. The contrast between Isaiah 53 and Psalm 45 continued to influence these depictions, with Jesus often portrayed as a suffering savior on the cross, but also as a majestic risen Lord. Constantine's support for Christianity also helped to formalize the theological debates of the early church. Under his reign, the First Council of Nicaea was convened in Anno Domini 325, where key doctrines about the nature of Christ were established. The council affirmed that Jesus was fully divine and fully human, a belief that shaped not only Christian theology, but also artistic representations of Christ for centuries to come. Constantine's influence didn't just affect theological debates and artistic depictions, it also paved the way for the construction of grand Christian churches, such as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, which further elevated the significance of Jesus' life and resurrection. These developments helped solidify the image of Jesus as both a humble servant and a divine ruler in the minds of Christians. The blending of these depictions, shaped by theology and imperial support, created a lasting legacy that would influence Christian art, thought, and worship throughout history. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to our channel, leave a comment, and like this video if you would want to receive more updates. While you're still here, click the video to view more amazing videos.